So back to it, I was <laughs> Physics, textbook of class 11th, part 1, chapter 5, Laws of Motion, narrated by Isna Rafat Khan. In the preceding chapter, our concern was to describe the motion of particle in space quantitatively. We saw that uniform motion needs the concept of velocity alone whereas non-uniform motion requires the concept of acceleration in addition. So far, we have not asked the question as to what governs the motion of bodies. In this chapter, we turn to this basic question. Let us first guess the answer based on our common experience. To move a football at rest, someone must kick it. To throw a stone upwards, one has to give it an upward push. A breeze causes the branches of tree to swing, and strong winds can even move heavy objects. A boat moves in a flowing river without anyone rowing it. Clearly, some external agency is needed to provide force to move a body from rest. Likewise, an external force is needed also to retard or stop motion. You can stop ball rolling down an inclined plane by applying a force against the direction of its motion. In these examples, the external agency of force, hands, winds, streams, etc. is in contact with the body. This is not always necessary. A stone released from top of a building accelerates downwards due to gravitational pull of the earth. A bar magnet can attract an iron nail from a distance. This shows that external agencies, example gravitational and magnetic forces, can exert force on a body even from a distance. In short, a force is required to put a stationary body in motion or stop a moving body and some external agency is required to provide this force. The external agency may or may not be in contact with the body. So far so good. But what if the body is moving uniformly? Example a skater moving straight with a constant speed on a horizontal eye slab is an external force required to keep a body in uniform motion aristotle's fallacy the question posed above appears to be simple however it took ages to answer it indeed the correct answer to this question given by galileo in 17th century was foundation of Newtonian mechanics, which signaled the birth of modern science. The Greek thinker Aristotle held the view that if a body is moving, something external is required to keep it moving. According to this view, for example, an arrow shot from a bow keeps flying since the air behind the arrow keeps pushing it. The view was part of an elaborate framework of ideas developed by Aristotle on the motion of bodies in the universe. Most of the Aristotelian ideas on the motion are now known to be wrong and need to concern us. For our purpose here, the Aristotelian law of motion may be phrased thus. An external force is required to keep a body in motion. The Aristotelian law of motion is flawed, as we shall see. However, it is a natural view that anyone would hold from common experience. Even a small child playing with a simple non-electric toy car on the floor knows intuitively that it needs to constantly drag the string attached to the toy with some force to keep it going. If it releases the string, it comes to rest. 
This experience is common to the most terrestrial motion. External force seem to be needed to keep bodies in motion. Left to themselves, all bodies eventually come to rest. What is the flaw in Aristotle's argument? The answer is a moving toy car comes to rest because the external force of friction on the car by floor opposes the motion. To counter this force, the child has to apply an external force on the car in the direction of motion. When the car is in uniform motion, there is no net external force acting on it. The force by child cancels the force friction by floor. The corollary is, if there were no friction, the child would not be required to apply any force to keep the toy car in uniform motion. The opposing force such as friction, solids and vicious forces for fluids are always present in the natural world. This explains why force by external agencies are necessary to overcome the frictional force to keep bodies in uniform motion. Now we understand where Aristotle went wrong. He quoted this practical experience in the form of basic argument to get true law of nature for forces and motion. One has to imagine a world in which uniform motion is possible with no frictional force opposing. This is what Galileo did. The law of inertia. Galileo studied motion of objects on an inclined plane. Objects moving down an inclined plane accelerate while those moving up retard. Motion on a horizontal plane is an intermediate situation. Galileo concluded that an object moving on a frictionless horizontal plane must neither have acceleration nor retardation. That is, it should move with constant velocity. Another experiment by Galileo leading to the same conclusion involves a double inclined plane. A ball released from rest on one of the plane rolls down and climbs up the other. If the planes are smooth, the final height of the ball is nearly same as the initial height, a little less but never greater. In the ideal situation where friction is absent, the final height of the ball is same as the initial height. If the slope of the second plane is decreased and the experiment repeated, the ball will still reach the same height, but in doing so, it will travel a longer distance. In the limiting case, when the slope of the second plane is zero, that is a horizontal, the ball travels an infinite distance. In the other words, its motion never ceases. This is of course an idealized situation. In practice, the ball does come to stop after moving a finite distance on the horizontal plane because of the opposing force of friction which can never be totally eliminated. However, if there were no friction, the ball would continue to move with a constant velocity on the horizontal plane. Galileo thus arrived at a new insight on motion that had eluded Aristotle and those who followed him. The state of rest and the state of uniform linear motion are equivalent in both the cases. There is no net force acting on the body. It is incorrect to assume that a net force is needed to keep a body in the uniform motion. To maintain a body in uniform motion, we need to apply an external force to counter the frictional force so that the two forces sum up to zero, net external force. To summarize, if the net external force is zero, a body at rest continues to remain at rest and a body in motion continues to move in a uniform velocity. This property of the body is called inertia. Inertia means resistance to change. A body does not change its state of rest or uniform motion unless an external force compels it to change that state. Newton's first law of motion. 
Galileo's simple but revolutionary ideas dethroned Aristotelian mechanics. A new mechanics had to be developed. This task was accomplished almost single-handedly by Isaac Newton, one of the greatest scientists of all times. Newton built on Galileo's idea and laid the foundation of mechanics in terms of three laws of motion that goes by his name. Galileo's law of inertia was his first starting point which he formulated as first law of motion. Every body continues to be in its state of rest or of uniform motion in a straight line unless compelled by some external force to act otherwise. The state of rest or uniform linear motion both imply zero acceleration. The first law of motion can therefore be simply expressed as if the net external force on a body is zero, its acceleration is zero. Acceleration can be non-zero if there is a net external force on the body. Two kinds of situations are encountered in the application of this law in practice. In some examples, we know that the net external force on the object is zero. In that case, we can conclude that the acceleration of the object is zero. For example, a spaceship out in the interstellar space, far from all other objects and with all its rockets turned off, has no net external force acting on it. Its acceleration, according to the first law, must be zero. If it is in motion, it must continue to move with a uniform velocity. More often, however, we do not know all the forces to begin with. In that case, if we know that an object is unaccelerated, that is, it is either at rest or in uniform linear motion, we can infer from the first law that the net external force on the object must be zero. Gravity is everywhere. For terrestrial phenomena in particular, every object experiences gravitational force due to the earth. Also, objects in motion generally experience friction, viscous drag, etc. If then, on earth, an object is at rest or in uniform linear motion, it is not because there are no forces acting on it, but because the various external forces cancel out, that is, add up to zero net external force. Consider a book at rest on a horizontal surface. It is subject to two external forces, the force due to gravity acting downward and upward force on the book by the table. The normal force R. R is a self-adjusting force. This is an example of a kind of situation mentioned above. The force are not quite known fully, but the state of motion is known. We observe the book to be at rest. Therefore, we conclude from the first law that the magnitude of R equals to that of W. A statement often encountered is, since W is equals to R, forces cancel and therefore the book is at rest. This is incorrect reasoning. The correct statement is, since the book is observed to be at rest, the net external force on it must be zero, according to the first law. This implies that the normal force R must be equal and opposite to the weight W. Consider the motion of car starting from rest, picking up speed and then moving on a smooth straight road with uniform speed. When the car is stationary, there is no net force acting on it. During pickup, it accelerates. It must happen due to a net external force. Note, it has to be an external force. The acceleration of the car cannot be accounted for by any internal force. This might sound surprising, but it is true. The only conceivable external force along the road is the force of friction. It is the force 
of friction that accelerates the car as a whole. You will learn about friction in section 5.9. When the car moves with a constant velocity, there is no external force. The property of inertia contained in the first law is evident in many situations. Suppose we are standing in a stationary bus and the driver starts the bus suddenly. We get thrown backward with a jerk. Why? Our feet are in touch with the floor. If there was no friction, we would remain where we were, while the floor of the bus would simply slip forward under our feet and the back of the bus would hit us. However, fortunately, there is some friction between the feet and the floor. If the start is not too sudden, that is if the acceleration is moderate, the friction force would be enough to accelerate our feet along with the bus. But our body is not strictly a rigid body, it is deformable, that is, it allows some relative displacement between the different parts. What this means is that while our feet go with the bus, the rest of the body remain where it was due to inertia. Relative to the bus, therefore, we are thrown backwards as soon as that happens. However, the muscular force on the rest of our body by our feet comes into play to move the body along with the bus. A similar thing happens when the bus suddenly stops. Our feet stop due to the motion between the feet and the floor of the bus, but the rest of the body continues to move forward due to inertia. We are thrown forward. The restoring muscular force again come into play and bring the body to rest. Example 5.1 An astronaut accidentally gets separated out of his small spaceship accelerating in interstellar space at a constant rate of 100 meter per second square. What is the acceleration of the astronaut? The instant after he is outside the spaceship, assume that there are no nearby stars to exert gravitational force on him. Since there are no nearby stars to exert gravitational force on him and the small spaceship exerts negligible gravitational attraction on him, the net force acting on the astronaut once he is out of the spaceship is zero. By the first law of motion, the acceleration of astronaut is zero. Newton's second law of motion. The first law refers to the simple case. When the net external force on the body is zero, the second law of motion refers to the general situation when there is a net external force acting on the body. It relates the net external force to the acceleration of the body. Momentum. Momentum P of a body is defined to be the product of its mass m and velocity v and is denoted by P. P is equals to mv. Momentum is clearly a vector quantity. The following common experience indicate the importance of this quantity for considering the effect of force on motion. Suppose a lightweight vehicle, say a small car and a heavy weight vehicle, say a loaded truck, are parked on a horizontal road. We all know that a much greater force is needed to push the truck than the car to bring them to the same speed in the same time. Similarly, a greater opposing force is needed to stop a heavy body than a light body in the same time if they are moving with the same speed. If two stones, one light and the other heavy, are dropped from the top of a building, a person on the ground will find it easier to catch the light stone than the heavy stone. The mass of a body is thus an important parameter that determines the effect of force on its motion. Speed is another important parameter to consider. A bullet fired by a gun can easily pierce human tissue before it stops, resulting in casualty. 
The same bullet fired with a moderate speed will not cause much damage. Thus, for a given mass, the greater the speed, the greater is the opposing force needed to stop the body in a certain time. Taken together, the product of mass and velocity, that is momentum, is evidently a relevant variable of motion. The greater change in the momentum in a given time, the greater is the force that needs to be applied. A seasoned cricketer catches a cricket ball coming in with a great speed far more easily than a novice who can hurt his hand in the act. One reason is that the cricketer allows a longer time for his hand to stop the ball. As you may have noticed, he draws in the hand backward in the act of catching the ball. The novice on the other hand keeps his hand fixed and tries to catch the ball almost in instantly. He needs to provide a much greater force to stop the ball instantly and this hurts. The conclusion is clear. Force not only depends on the change in momentum but also how fast the change is brought about. The same change in momentum brought about in a shorter time needs a greater applied force. In short, the greater the rate of change of momentum, the greater the force. Observations confirm that the product of mass and velocity, that is momentum, is basic to the effect of force on motion. Suppose a fixed force is applied for a certain interval of time on two bodies of different masses. Initially at rest, the lighter body picks up a greater speed than the heavier body. However, at the end of the time interval, observations shows that each of the body acquires the same momentum. Thus, the same force for the same time cause the same change in momentum for different bodies. This is a crucial clue to the second law of motion. In the preceding observations, the vector character of momentum has not been evident. In the examples so far, momentum and change in momentum both have the same direction. But this is not always the case. Suppose a stone is rotated with uniform speed in a horizontal plane by means of a string. The magnitude of momentum is fixed, but its direction changes. The force is needed to cause this change in momentum vector. This force is provided by our hand through a string. Experience suggests that our hand needs to exert a greater force if the stone is rotated at a greater speed or in a circle of a small radius or both. This corresponds to greater acceleration or equivalently a greater rate of change in momentum vector. This suggests that the greater the rate of change in momentum vector, the greater is the force applied. These qualitative observations lead to the second law of motion expressed by Newton as follows. The rate of change of momentum of a body is directly proportional to the applied force and takes place in the direction in which the force acts. Thus, if under the action of a force F for a time interval delta t, the velocity of the body of mass m changes from v to v plus delta v. That is, its initial momentum P is equals to mv changes by delta P is equals to m delta v. According to the second law, F is directly proportional to delta P by delta t or F is equals to constant k into delta P divided by delta t where k is a constant of proportionality. The unit of force has not been defined so far. In SI unit, force is 1 that causes an acceleration of 1 meter per second square to a mass of 1 kg. This unit is known as Newton. 1 Newton is equals to 1 kg meter per second square. Let us note 
at this stage some important points about the newton's second law in the second law f is equals to 0 implies a is equals to 0 the second law is obviously consistent with the first law second the second law of motion is a vector law it is equivalent to the three equations one for each component of vectors this means that if a force is not parallel to the velocity of the body but makes some angle with it, it changes only the component of velocity along the direction of force. The component of velocity normal to the force remains unchanged. For example, in the motion of a projectile under the vertical gravitational force, the horizontal component of velocity remains unchanged. The second law of motion is applicable to a single point particle. The force F in the law stands for the net external force on the particle and A stands for acceleration of the particle. It turns out, however, that the law in the same form applies to a rigid body or even more generally to a system of particles. In that case, F refers to the total external force on the system and A refers to the acceleration of the system as a whole. More precisely, A is the acceleration of the center of mass of the system. Any internal force in the system are not to be included in F. Fourth, the second law of motion is a local relation which means that force F at a point in space at a certain instant of time is related to A at that point at that instant. Acceleration here and now is determined by the force here and now, not by any history of the motion of particle. Impulse we sometimes encounter examples where a large force acts for a very short duration, producing a finite change in momentum of the body. For example, when a ball hits a wall and bounces back, the force on the ball by the wall acts for a very short time when the two are in contact. Yet, the force is large enough to reverse the momentum of the ball. Often, in these situations, the force and the time durations are difficult to ascertain separately. However, the product of force and time, which is the change in momentum of the body, remains a measurable quantity. This product is called impulse. Impulse is equals to force into time duration is equals to change in momentum. A large force acting for a short time to produce a finite change in momentum is called an impulsive force. In the history of science, impulsive forces were put in conceptually different category from ordinary forces. Newtonian mechanics has no such distinctions. Impulsive forces is like any other force except that it is large and acts for a short time. Newton's third law of motion. The second law relates the external force on the body to its acceleration. What is the origin of external force on the body? What agencies provide external force? The simple answer in Newtonian mechanics is that the external force on the body always arise due to some other body. Consider a pair of bodies A and B. B gives rise to an external force on A. A natural question is does A in turn gives rise to an external force on B? In some examples, the answer seems clear. If you press a coiled spring, the spring compressed by the force of your hand. The compressed spring in turn exerts a force on your hand and you can feel it. But if a body are not is in direct contact, 
The earth pulls a stone downwards due to gravity. Does the stone exerts force on the earth? The answer is not obvious since we hardly see the effect of a stone on the earth. The answer according to Newton is yes. The stone does exert an equal and opposite force on the earth. We do not notice it since the earth is very massive and the effect of a small force on its motion is negligible. Thus, according to Newtonian mechanics, force never occurs singly in nature. Force is a mutual interaction between two bodies. Force always occurs in pair. Further, the mutual force between two bodies are always equal and opposite. This idea was expressed by Newton in the form of the third law of motion. To every action, there is always an equal and opposite reaction. Newton's wording of third law is so crisp and beautiful that it has become a part of common language. For some reasons, perhaps, misconceptions about third law abound. Let us note some important points about the third law, particularly in regard to the usage of the terms action and reaction. The terms action and reaction in the third law means nothing else but force. Using different terms for the same physical concepts can sometimes be confusing. A simple and clear way of stating the third law is as follows. Force always occurs in pairs. Force on body A by B is equal and opposite to the force on body B by A. The term action and reaction in the third law may give a wrong impression that action comes before reaction. That is, action is the cause and reaction the effect. There is no cause-effect relation implied in the third law. The force on A by B and the force on B by A act at the same instant. By the same reasoning, any one of them may be called action and the other called reaction. Action and reaction forces acts on different bodies, not on the same body. Consider a pair of bodies A and B. According to the third law, FAB is equals to minus FBA. Force on A by B is equals to minus force on B by A. Thus, if we are considering the motion of any one body, only one of the two forces is relevant. It is an error to add up the two forces and claim that the net force is zero. However, if you are considering the system of two bodies as a whole, FAB and FBA are internal forces of the system. They add up to give a null force. Internal forces in a body or a system of particles this cancel away in pairs. This is an important fact that enables the second law to be applicable to a body or a system of particles. Conservation of Momentum the second and the third laws of motion lead to an important consequence, the law of conservation of momentum. Take a familiar example. A bullet is fired from a gun. If the force on the bullet by the gun is F, the force on the gun by bullet is minus F, according to the third law. The two force act on a common interval of time delta T, according to the second law. F delta T is the change in momentum of the bullet and minus F delta T is the change in momentum of the gun. Since initially both are at rest, the change in momentum equals the final momentum for each. Thus, if PB is the momentum of the bullet after firing and PG is the recoil momentum of the gun, PG is equal to minus PB. That is, PB plus PG is equals to zero. That is, the total momentum of bullet plus gun system is conserved. This is an isolated system. That is a system 
with no external force. Mutual force between pairs of particle in a system can cause momentum change in individual particles. But since the mutual force for each pair are equal and opposite, the momentum change cancels in pair and the total momentum remains unchanged. This fact is known as the law of conservation of momentum. The total momentum of an isolated system of interacting particles is conserved. An important example of the application of law of conservation of momentum is collision of two bodies. Consider two bodies A and B with the initial momentum PA and PB. The bodies collide gets apart with final momentum P-A and P-B respectively. By the second law, F A B delta T is equals to P dash A minus P A and F B A delta T is equals to P dash B minus P B where we have taken a common interval of time for both forces that is the time for which the two bodies are in contact. Since F A B is equals to F B A by the third law P dash A minus P A is equals to minus P dash B minus P B that is P dash A plus P dash B is equals to P A plus P B which shows that the total final momentum of the isolated system equals the initial momentum. Notice that this is true whether the collision is elastic or inelastic. In elastic collisions there is a second condition that the total initial kinetic energy of the system equals the total final kinetic energy. Equilibrium of a particle. Equilibrium of a particle in mechanics refers to the situation when the net external force on the particle is zero. According to the first law, this means that the particle is either at rest or in uniform motion. If two force F1 and F2 act on a particle, equilibrium requires F1 is equals to minus F2. That is, the two force on the particle must be equal and opposite. Equilibrium under three concurrent forces F1, F2 and F3 requires that the vector sum of the three forces is zero. F1 plus F2 plus F3 is equals to zero. In other words, the resultant of any two forces, say F1 and F2, obtained by the parallel gram laws of force must be equal and opposite to the third force F3. As seen in figure 5.7, the three force in equilibrium can be presented by sides of triangle with vector arrows taken in the same sense. The result can be generalized to any number of forces. A particle is in equilibrium under the action of force 1, 2 and n. If they can be represented by the sides of a closed n-sided polygon with arrows directed in the same sense. Common forces in mechanics. In mechanics, we encounter several kind of forces. The gravitational force is of course all pervasive. Every object on the earth experiences the force of gravity due to the earth. Gravity also governs the motion of celestial bodies. The gravitational force can act at a distance without the need of any intervening medium. All the other forces common in mechanics are contact forces. As the name suggests, a contact force on an object arises due to the contact with some other object, solid or fluid. When bodies are in contact, example a book resting on a table, a system of rigid bodies connected by rods, hinges and other types of supports. These are mutual contact forces. Satisfying the third law. 
the component of contact force normal to the surface in contact is called the normal reaction the component parallel to the surface in contact is called friction contact force arise also when solids are in contact with fluids for example for a solid immersed in a fluid there is an upward buoyant force equal to the weight of the fluid displaced the viscous force air resistance etc are also examples of contact forces two other common forces are tension in a spring and the force due to spring when a spring is compressed or extended by an external force a restoring force is generated this force is usually proportional to the compression or elongation the spring force f is written as f is equals to minus kx where x is the displacement and k is the force constant the negative sign denotes that the force is opposite to the displacement from the unstressed state for an inextensible string the force constant is very high the restoring force in a string is called tension it is customary to use a constant tension t throughout the string this assumption is true for a string of negligible mass in chapter 1 we learned that there are four fundamental forces in nature of these the weak and strong forces appear in domains that do not concern us here only gravitational and electric forces are relevant in the context of mechanics the different contact forces of mechanics mentioned above fundamentally arise from electrical forces this may seem surprising since we are talking of uncharged and non-charged magnetic bodies in mechanics at microscopic level all bodies are made of charged constituents nuclei and electrons and the various contact forces arise due to elasticity of bodies molecular collisions and impacts etc can ultimately be traced to the electrical forces between the charged constituents of different bodies the detailed microscopic origin of these forces is however complex and not useful for handling problems in mechanics at the macroscopic scale this is why they are treated as different types of forces with their characteristic properties determined empirically friction let us turn to the example of a body of mass m at rest on a horizontal table the force of gravity mg is cancelled by the normal reaction force n of the table now suppose a force f is applied horizontally to the body we know from experience that a small applied force may not be enough to move the body but if the applied force f were the only external force on the body it must move with acceleration f by m however small clearly the body remains at rest because some other force comes into play in the horizontal direction and opposes the applied force f resulting in zero net force on the body this force fs parallel to the surface of the body in contact with the table is known as frictional force or simply friction note that static friction does not exist by itself when there is no applied force there is no static friction it comes into play the moment there is an applied force as the applied force f increases fs or the static friction also increases remaining equal and opposite to the applied force up to a certain limit keeping the body at rest hence it is called static friction static friction opposes impending motion the term impending motion means motion that would take place but 
does not actually take place under the applied force if the friction were absent. We know from experience that the applied force exceeds a certain limit, the body begins to move. It is found experimentally that the limiting value of static friction Fs max is independent of the area of contact and varies with the normal force N approximately as Fs max is equal to mu S N where mu s is a constant of proportionality depending only on the nature of surface in contact. The constant mu s is called the coefficient of static friction. The law of static friction may thus be written as f s is less than or equal to mu s n. If the applied force F exceeds Fs max, the body begins to slide on the surface. It is found experimentally that when relative motion has started, the frictional force decreases from the static maximum value Fs max. Frictional force that opposes relative motion between surface and contact is called kinetic motion or sliding friction and is denoted by Fk. Kinetic friction, like static friction, is found to be independent of the area of contact. Further, it is nearly independent of the velocity. It satisfies a law similar to that for the static friction. Fk is equals to mu k into n, where mu k, the coefficient of kinetic friction, depends only on the surface in contact. As mentioned above, experiments shows that mu k is less than mu s. When relative motion has begun, the acceleration of the body according to the second law is F minus Fk divided by M. For a body moving with constant velocity, F is equals to Fk. If applied force on the body is removed, its acceleration is minus Fk divided by M and it eventually comes to a stop. The laws of friction given above do not have the status of fundamental laws like those for the gravitational, electric and magnetic forces. They are empirical relations that are only approximately true. Yet they are very useful in practical calculations in mechanics. Thus, when two bodies are in contact, each experiences a force of contact by the other. Friction by definition is the component of the contact force parallel to the surface in contact, which opposes impending or actual relative motion between the two surfaces. Note that it is not motion but relative motion that frictional force opposes. Consider a box lying in the compartment of a train that is accelerating. If the box is stationary relative to the train, it is in fact accelerating along with the train. What forces can cause acceleration of the box? Clearly, only conceivable force in the horizontal direction is the force of friction. If there were no friction, the floor of the train would slip by and the box would remain at its initial position due to inertia and hit the back side of the train. This impending relative motion is opposed by the static friction Fs. Static friction provides the same acceleration to the box as that of the train, keeping it stationary relative to the train. Rolling friction. A body like a ring or a sphere rolling without slipping over a horizontal plane will suffer no friction in principle. 
at every instant there is just one point of contact between the body and the plane and this point has no motion relative to the plane in this ideal situation kinetic or static friction is zero and the body should continue to roll with constant velocity we know in practice this will not happen and some resistance to motion that is rolling friction does occur that is to keep the body rolling some applied force is needed for the same weight rolling friction is smaller even by two or three orders of magnitude than static or sliding friction this is the reason why discovery of wheel has been a major milestone in human history rolling friction again has a complex origin though somewhat different from that of static and sliding friction during rolling the surface in contact get momentarily deformed a little and this results in a finite area not a point of the body in being contact with the surface the net effect is that the component of contact force parallel to the surface opposes the motion we often regard friction as something undesirable in many situations like in a machine with different moving parts friction does have a negative role it opposes relative motion and thereby dissipates power in the form of heat etc lubricants are a way of reducing kinetic friction in a machine another way is to use ball bearings between two moving parts of a machine since the rolling friction between the ball bearings and the surface in contact is very small power dissipation is reduced a thin cushion of air maintained between solid surface in relative motion is another effective way of reducing friction in many practical situations however friction is critically needed kinetic friction that dissipates power is nevertheless important for quickly stopping relative motion it is made use of by brakes in machine and automobiles similarly static friction is important in daily life we are able to walk because of friction it is impossible for a car to move on a very slippery road on an ordinary road the friction between the tires and the road provide the necessary external force to accelerate the car circular motion we have seen in chapter 4 that acceleration of a body moving in a circle of radius r with uniform speed v is v square by r directed towards the center according to the second law the force f providing this acceleration is equals to force is equals to m v square divided by r where m is the mass of the body this force directed forwards the center is called the centripetal force for a stone rotated in a circle by a string the centripetal force is provided by the tension in the string the centripetal force for motion of a planet around the sun is the gravitational force on the planet due to the sun for a car taking a circular turn on a horizontal road the centripetal force is the force of friction the circular motion of a car on a flat and banked road gives interesting applications of the laws of motion motion of car on a level road three forces act on the car one the weight of the car mg 2 normal reaction n 
3 frictional force F. As there is no acceleration in the vertical direction, N minus Mg is equal to 0, N is equal to Mg. The centripetal force required for circular motion is along the surface of the road and is provided by the component of the contact force between the road and the car tires along the surface. This by definition is the frictional force. Note that it is the static friction that provides the centripetal acceleration. The static friction opposes the impending motion of the car moving away from the circle. Motion of a car on a banked road. We can reduce the contribution of friction to the circular motion of the car if the road is banked. Since there is no acceleration along the vertical direction, the net force along this direction must be zero. Hence, n cos theta is equals to mg plus f sin theta. The centripetal force is provided by the horizontal components of n and f. Solving problem in mechanics. The three laws of motion that you have learned in this chapter are the foundation of mechanics. You should now be able to handle a large variety of problems in mechanics. A typical problem in mechanics usually did not merely involve a single body under the action of given forces. More often, we need to consider an assembly of different bodies exerting forces on each other. Besides, each body in the assembly experiences the force of gravity. When trying to solve a problem of this type, it is useful to remember the fact that we can choose any part of the assembly and apply the laws of motion to the part provided. We include all the forces on the chosen part due to the remaining parts of the assembly. We may call the chosen part of the assembly as the system and the remaining part of the assembly as the environment. We have followed the same method in solved examples. To handle a typical problem in mechanics systematically, one should use the following steps. 1. Draw a diagram showing schematically the various parts of the assembly of the bodies, the links, supports, etc. 2. Choose a convenient part of the assembly as one system. 3. Draw a separate diagram which shows this system and all the forces on the system by the remaining part of the assembly. Include also the forces on the system by other agencies. Do not include the forces on the environment by the system. A diagram of this type is known as a free body diagram. Note, this does not imply that the system under consideration is without a net force. In a free body diagram, include information about the forces, their magnitudes, their directions that are either given or you are sure of. Example, the direction of the tension in the string along its length. The rest should be treated as unknowns to be determined using the laws of motion. If necessary, follow the same procedure for another choice of the system. In doing so, employ Newton's third law, that is, if in the free body diagram of A, a force on A due to B is shown as F, then in the free body diagram of B, the force on B due to A should be shown as minus F. The important thing to remember is that an action-reaction pair consists of mutual forces which are always equal and opposite between two bodies. 
two forces on the same body which happen to be equal and opposite can never constitute an action-reaction pair. In practice, drawing a free body diagram is of great help in solving problems in mechanics. It allows you to clearly define your system and consider all forces on the system due to objects that are not part of the system itself. A number of exercises in this subsequent chapter will help you cultivate this practice. Summary 1. Aristotle's view that a force is necessary to keep a body in uniform motion is wrong. A force is necessary in practice to counter the opposite forces of friction. 2. Galileo extrapolated simple observations on motion of bodies on inclined plane and arrived at the law of inertia. Newton's first law of motion is the same law rephrased thus. Every body continues to be in the state of rest or of uniform motion in a straight line unless compelled by some external force to act otherwise. In simple terms, the first law is if external force on the body is zero, its acceleration is zero. 3. Momentum of a body is the product of its mass and velocity. P is equals to mv. 4. Newton's second law of motion. The rate of change of momentum of a body is proportional to the applied force and takes place in the direction in which the force acts. 5. Impulse is the product of force and time which equals change in momentum. The notion of impulse is useful when a large force acts for a short time to produce a measurable change in momentum. Since the time of action of force is very short, one can assume that there is no appreciable change in the position of the body during the action of impulsive force. Sixth, Newton's third law of motion. To every action, there is always an equal and opposite reaction. In simple terms, the law can be stated thus. Force in nature always occur in pair of bodies. Force on a body A by body B is equal and opposite to the force on the body B by A. Action and reaction forces are simultaneous forces. There is no cause-effect relation between action and reaction. Any of the two mutual forces can be called action and the other reaction. Action and reaction act on different bodies and so they cannot be cancelled out. The internal action and reaction forces between different parts of the body do, however, sum to zero. Seventh, Law of Conservation of momentum. The total momentum of an isolated system of particles is conserved. The law follows from the second and the third law of motion. Eighth, friction. Frictional force opposes relative motion between two surfaces in contact. It is the component of the contact force along the common tangent to the surface in contact. Static friction Fs opposes impending relative motion. Kinetic friction Fk opposes actual relative motion. They are independent of the area of contact and satisfy the following approximate laws. Fs is less than or equal to Fs max is equal to mu sr. Fk is equal to mu kr. Mu s coefficient of static friction and mu k coefficient of kinetic friction are constants 
characteristic of the pair of surface and contact it is found experimentally that mu k is less than mu s points to ponder 1 force is not always in direction of motion depending on the situation f may be along v opposite to v normal to v or may make some other angle with v in every case it is parallel to acceleration if v is equals to zero at an instant that is if a body is momentarily at rest it does not mean that the force or acceleration are necessarily zero at that instant for example when a ball thrown upwards reaches a maximum height v is equals to zero but the force continues to be its weight mg and the acceleration is not zero but g force on a body at a given time is determined by the situation at the location of the body at that time force is not carried by the body from its earlier history of motion the moment after a stone is released out of an accelerated train there is no horizontal force or acceleration to the stone if the effect of the surrounding air are neglected the stone then has only a vertical force of gravity fourth in the second law of motion f is equals to m a f stands for the net force due to all material agencies external to the body a is the effect of the force m a should not be regarded as yet another force besides f 5 the centripetal force should not be regarded as yet another kind of force it is simply a name given to the force that provides inward radial acceleration to a body in circular motion we should always look for some material force like tension gravitational force electrical force friction etc as the centripetal force in any circular motion sixth static friction is a self-adjusting force up to its limit mu s n do not put mu s into n is equals to f s without being sure that the maximum value of the static friction is coming into play seventh the familiar equation mg is equals to r for a body on the table is true only if the body is in equilibrium the two force mg and r can be different example a body in an accelerated lift the quality of mg and r has no connection with the third law eighth the term action and reaction in the third law of motion simply stand for simultaneous mutual forces between a pair of bodies unlike their meaning in the ordinary language action does not proceed or cause reaction action and reaction act on different bodies ninth the different terms like friction normal reaction tension air resistance wishes drag thrust buoyancy weight centripetal force all stand for force in different contexts for clarity every force and its equivalent term encountered in mechanics should be reduced to phrase force on a by b 10 for applying the second law of motion there is no conceptual distinction between inanimate and animate object an animate object such as a human also requires an external force to accelerate for example without the external force of friction we cannot walk on the ground 11th 
The objective concept of force in physics should not be confused with the subjective concept of the feeling of force. On a merry-go-round, all parts of our body are subject to an inward force, but we have a feeling of being pushed outward, the direction of impending motion.